at a symbolic computation conference in Japan on the theme of algebraic statistics. So there's several messages in the talk. One of them is Jose is a great guy. So let's see how it goes. So maximum likelihood for matrices with rank constraints. <coughs> so we're considering two discrete random variables where the first random variable has m states and the second random variable has n states. I'm going to write a table or matrix, an m by n matrix for uh, joint probability distributions. So the entries are non-negative real numbers that sum to 1. So the entry pij represents the probability that the first variable is in state i and the second variable is in state j. Now inside the simplex of all such distributions, so the set of all such matrices forms a space of dimension mn minus 1 and non-negativity says we lie in a simplex and let's look inside the simplex at the manifold of rank R matrices. Okay, so look at the set of all matrices that uh, have rank exactly R, I'm going to call that MR and maybe disregarding the boundary for a moment this is a smooth manifold of a certain dimension. Now the elements represent uh, distributions that have a particular property. They are conditionally independent in a sense to be explained. But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to replace this manifold MR that requires real numbers um, by an easier object, namely the variety of complex matrices of rank at most R. So we're going to do three things. We first uh, relax rank exactly R to rank at most R, that makes it closed. Replace the real numbers by complex numbers. And finally, to make it even easier, we replace uh, affine space by projective space. And we're going to write VR for the so risky closure. So this is the determinantal variety, the variety of matrices whose R plus 1 times R plus 1 minors vanish. So, so question, you said that we're, we're so, so the, the, the manifold MR, right, this guy is smooth. Mm -hmm. So when we actually go ahead and include all the other, you know, sort of, mm -hmm. the, the other manifolds, of R minus 1 or N of R minus yep. 2, how does this change like the smoothness? Well, we pick up singularities. So, so think about MR as this sheet of paper except for this crease, uh -huh. right? So that uh, sort of an open set and that's smooth, right? But if I take the closure, if I include this line segment, then the closure puts it back in and I pick up some singularities. So picture is exactly like this. Um, well, so here's one of my favorite examples. Some of you have seen this. So we're in the Soccer World Cup. And uh, every day in the newspaper we read that uh, some food, there was a lot of discussion about food in this group in recent weeks. So some food or some behavior causes some medical condition. So for example, we could ask, does watching soccer, football on television cause you to lose hair? Okay. So in this, so I learned this in an intro, you know, statistics book. So 296, a made up story, British individuals were interviewed about the hair length and how many hours per week they watch soccer on TV. Okay. So they responded, so we disc discretized this and we turned this into two ternary random variables. The first one is uh, soccer watching and, you know, a little bit, medium, a lot, right, hours per week. And then the hair volume, well, lots of hair, medium hair, and little hair, let's say, okay? So we ask these people and everybody chooses one combination and then we total the number of people. So for example, there are 27 respondents with medium hair volume who watch a lot of soccer, okay? So you look at this table, look at this data, and you might well ask, is there a correlation between watching soccer and hair loss, or are they independent? Do they have anything to do with each other? And of course, if there's correlation, you would like to jump to causation, right? Because that gets you in the newspaper, right? So, um, well, 
Are these things independent? Well, independence would mean that the two by two minors of this matrix are zero, right? So if this were a perfect rank one table, then we would have perfect independence, right? Because the probability of x being a state i and y being in state j would be the product, and then this table would be roughly a rank one matrix. Now you look at the two by two minors, there are nine of them, and they're all strictly positive. Okay? So I cooked up the numbers that you know any this product exceeds that product. So every two by two minor is strictly positive by quite a margin. Okay? So this suggests that these two variables are maybe positively correlated, right? The more soccer, the less hair, and vice versa. Okay? Well, not really. Okay, suppose we knew that there is a hidden binary random variable called gender. Right? So gender is a binary random variable that has two states, male and female. And suppose we knew that our table breaks up into 1626 male respondents and 170 female respondents. Right? Well, then you see here that these two separate tables are perfectly rank one. Right? So I made it up so that uh, the male table is a perfect rank one table, the female table is a perfect rank one table, and they add up to a rank two table. Okay? So conditioned on gender. So if we fix the gender, then these two attributes are independent in this data set. So, uh, okay, so maybe in sort of statistical language, if we had a, a null hypothesis that soccer on TV and hair growth are independent given gender, then uh, this supports this, so we will not reject the null hypothesis. Okay, in the statistics you never accept the null hypothesis, you either reject or you don't, and here we certainly don't reject it. Okay, so, so what we see here is that uh, we have a conditional independence statement, so this table lies on M2. So this represents a distribution, empirical distribution, on the manifold M2. Okay, the likelihood function. <coughs> so now we have our data. So we have sampled IID from an unknown distribution and we summarize this in an M by N table of positive integers, non-negative integers, where UIJ is the number of people with, uh, you know, soccer status I and hair status J. The uh, total sum, if I add all entries, I denote this by U++, plus plus. that's the sample size. <coughs> and then I'm going to be interested in the monomial specified by U. So that's the likelihood function, that's the product over all I and all J of Pij to the Uij. So Pij is an unknown probability, that I don't know, that I would like to learn, but Uij is uh, the count, the, the sample that I've given. So except for a factor, a multinomial distribution, um, we have an optimization problem. We like to maximize this likelihood function subject to P being a conditional independent table. So P being in the rank R model. Uh, typically, for typical data, there will be a unique solution to this optimization problem. I'm going to call that P hat and that's the maximum likelihood estimate for you. Okay? Now yesterday we talked a little bit in the afternoon that there's other things you can do with this function. You could also integrate over M and some people like Charles Chan are very good at making exact rational numbers out of this, but that would be a Bayesian thing to do. So here we're going to just solve the optimization problem or try to solve the optimization problem to maximize a monomial function over MR. So today I want everybody to understand everything, at least in the morning. So if there's anything unclear, now is the time to ask. So if you don't know what UIJ is, you know, now would be the time to ask. But plenty of time this morning. Okay, so suppose R is 1. Okay, so how do you do this? <coughs> so for rank 1, there's a very simple rule for calculating the maximum likelihood estimate. Namely, the rule is row sums times column sums. So what you do is you uh, 
form the column vector of all row sums. So the entry is ui plus, right? So, so this is just the, the total number of people according to their soccer status, right? So that's ui plus is everybody in the ith row added up. And then also on the right, you have the row vector of column sums. So you tally everybody according to their hair status. Then you multiply these two vectors. You get an m by n matrix of rank r. And then to turn this into probability distribution, you divide by the square of the sample size. Okay, so, so this turns out to be, this is the unique, complex, critical point of the likelihood function. So it's the unique real critical point, and it's a local and hence global maximum. So this is it, that's easy to check, okay? So we teach this to freshman biologists, okay? more or less. Okay? You take the row sum, take the column sum, multiply, that's how you estimate your parameters, okay? Um, now you speak to practitioners. So this is an engineering school, right? There's lots of engineers and applied mathematicians. So they would say, that's a nice analytic solution. You've heard this term, right? People talk about analytic solutions. In Hong Kong, when they study applied math, they talk all this an analytic solution. Now the adjective analytic solution suggests that this solution involves analysis. And furthermore, it suggests that analysis is a useful subject of mathematics. That is true. Analysis is indeed a useful subject of mathematics. But this is not analysis, okay? This is an algebraic solution. Don't ever let anybody tell you that this kind of thing is an analytic solution. This is an algebraic solution because just like analysis, also algebra is a very useful subject of math. So this is a very simple algebraic solution. So in which sense is it simple? It's simple in the sense that p hat is a rational function of the data. So each entry in the matrix p hat is a rational function of the data. And uh, in fact, it's a rational function of the sufficient statistics, right? So, so sufficient statistic, being sufficient statistic means being a quantity through which the likelihood function factors, right? So, Vissarion has a data set and Matt has a data set. If they have the same row sums and the column sums, they're going to lead the same estimate, right? So they have the same sufficient statistics. Now, just to be clear, what do I mean by a rational function? Well, a rational function, of course, is a ratio of polynomials, but it's also an algebraic function of degree one, right? To write down the answer in terms of the data, you don't have to extend the field. You can, you know, stay in the same ground field to write the answer. So that's an algebraic function of degree one. In this maximum likelihood estimations, how do you decide the rank of your sample? How do I decide? Uh, that's a very, very, very good question. The question, how do I decide which R to pick? I don't know, right? So I, all I know is M and N, and I see the table, right? So now I have to make a, somehow a guess what R should be. Okay, and so that's a problem of what's called model selection, right? And maybe there are two competing models. Maybe, you know, maybe you think it's probably rank three, and Jose thinks maybe it's rank two, and Abraham thinks it's rank four, right? So we have four competing models. Now we have to make a decision, okay? Now to decide that problem, what we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate the maximum likelihood model estimate in all three models, and then we make a decision, okay? Now, the way people do that right now, they apply Bayesian methods. In fact, they avoid doing the integral. They plug into something called the BIC, the Bayesian Information Criterion, that based on the LMLE and the degrees of freedom, you're going to pick among those three. But to do this more accurately, you need what Watanabe calls a widely applicable information criterion, the WIC, which you'll learn about next week, because your model is the single locus of Abraham's and Jose's is the single locus of yours. That's why singularities are very important. But that's a problem, that's sort of a next problem. So here we're just fixing R and we're computing the MLE, but in a, in a model selection problem you have to do this for different values of R and possibly other competing models. Okay, so the first non-trivial case concerns three by three matrices of rank R, so M and N of rank two. So M and N are three, 
and R is 2. So let's recap what's the model. So we're interested in non-negative 3 by 3 matrices P. We want the entries to sum to 1 and we want the rank to be 2 and so we want the determinant to vanish. Okay, so that's the constraints and then the function we want to maximize, well it's the monomial given by the data. Okay, so typically people take the logarithm, you know, but it's the same. Right? So log likelihood function is the sum of all uij times log pij. Um, well, how do we do this in a nonlinear algebra class? Well, we set up the equations, right? So we apply Lagrange multiplier, so here are the constraints again, the determinant is 0 and then P plus plus is 1. And then what's Lagrange multipliers geometrically? Well, here's my, uh, so nice to have toilet paper, so here's my variety again, right? So what does Lagrange multiplier mean? Well, Lagrange multiplier means I look at the gradient of the objective function, right? And I'm looking for a point on the, man of, on the variety where the gradient vector is orthogonal to the tangent space. Okay? So I want the gradient vector to be perpendicular to the tangent space. That's Lagrange multipliers. Right? So, okay, so how do we phrase that? Well, we look at the following. This translates into the following rank condition on a 3 by 9 matrix. So I write down the, the flattening or vectorization of my data. So U11 up to U33, that's the first row that's just the data, not positive integers. Then the second row, these are my unknowns, my decision variables, P11 up to P33. And then the last row, I write down cubic elements. And what I do is I take uh, P11 times A11, which is the derivative of P with respect to P11. So those are the, the two by two minors of the matrix, the cofactors, right? If you have a three by three determinant, you take the derivative with respect to one of the entries, you get the other, the complementary 2 by 2 mine, up to sign. Okay, so, and that's what you write down. And then these rows are supposed to be linearly dependent, and that's exactly the condition that the gradient of the log likelihood function is in the uh, tangent space at the low rank manifold. Okay. Okay, so now you're ready to go, right? So this is a small problem and you know, we don't need anything fancy of the kind that Matt knows. We just type this into Macaulay, right? We make the 3 by 3 minors vanish of this matrix. Um, we write this down, we write that down. Then we have to saturate a little bit. We have to saturate by the Pij because we want solutions in the interior of the simplex. And we also have to saturate, well, by the by the two by two minors of this matrix, right? We want to really, we're looking for critical points on the actual rank two, right? So we wanna, you know, now we're focusing on R equals two, right? If we wanted to do R equals one or three, we do a separate calculation. So we have to do, that's the hard part, is the saturation. When you're done, you count roots and there are 10, okay? So there are 10 complex solutions to this problem. Okay. So we say this problem has algebraic degree or algebraic complexity 10. Okay, so guys in the last row, what does that mean? Okay, you write down all of these equations. Well, do you use a computer algebra system? Do you use SAGE, Mathematica, MATLAB, Maple, Reduce, which? Maple, Mathematica? MATLAB. So in MATLAB, that's a numerical package, so in MATLAB you call the symbolic toolbox. Okay, so from within MATLAB you call the symbolic toolbox, you write down these polynomials, you eliminate eight of the nine variables, and you get one equation in one variable, say P33. That equation has rational coefficients and has degree 10. Okay. So therefore, to write down the answer, you have to pass to a field extension of degree 10. You have to write down an algebraic number of degree 10 over Q. Many of us believe that they don't need to know that because floating point numbers is all that matters. And if you believe that, good. Okay. 
But if you're interested truly in the nature of that floating point number that your software outputs, then I'll tell you it's going to have degree 10 over Q. So the ML degree of a statistical model of this kind, or a, a projective variety more generally, is the number of critical points of the log likelihood function or likelihood function for generic data. So if you take the, uh, the log likelihood function, you take the derivatives, everything is rational. Right? So the nice thing about the logarithm function is that among friends it's kind of a polynomial. Right? So the derivative of the log is 1 over x, and then you clear denominators, you know, so, so algebraic geometry is like the logarithm. There's a subject called logarithmic algebraic geometry, right? There's something called, you know, logarithmic sheaves. I mean, algebraic geometers love the logarithm because its derivative is 1 over x. It's basically a polynomial, okay? <coughs> so here are the known values of the maximum likelihood degree for our rank varieties. So here is... Uh, <coughs> M and N, that's the matrix size. So 3 by 3, 4 by 6, and so on. And here's the rank R that we are interested in. So for example, if rank is 1, then we have this very simple analytic, whoops, algebraic solution. Row sums times column sums, that always gives us rank 1. Okay, so that's the first row of 1s. Now, down at the bottom, we also have 1s. Well, Suppose we're looking for a 3x3 three three matrix of rank 3, right? And you're giving typical data. Well, the data will have rank 3, right? You just divide by the sample size, right? That's the best estimate. So if you have some data set, you know, that's rank 3, and you want a best rank 3 probability distribution, you just use the data. Right? Just divide by the sample size, okay? So that's evidently an algebraic function of the degree 10. One. Then we have the number 10, that's the one we just discussed, and then there are a whole bunch of other numbers, right? So, so for example, if we have a 5 by 5 matrix and we're interested in the best rank 2 estimate, then the ML degree is 6776. Okay. So this means when you go from MATLAB into the symbolic toolbox, and you type in all of these equations, you eliminate all but one of the unknowns, you get one polynomial in one variable of degree 6776 with rational coefficients, and that's the expected number of complex solutions. Of those complex solutions, some number will be real, maybe 2,000. Of those real solutions, some number will have positive coordinates maybe 435. Of those 435, you know, some will be local maxima, minima, critical points, you know. So the local maxima, maybe there are 127. And then those are the ones you're going to look at. And you're going to pick the one you like best. So these are what statisticians call them the modes. Right? These are the local maxima of the likelihood function. Now, I know you look at this table. What's the first thing you notice? Symmetry, right? I mean, the first thing you look at this, you know, you look at these columns and it's symmetric. Now, when we first saw that about two years ago, maybe a little more than two, we were shocked. I was shocked. I didn't expect this at all. Well, why was that shocking? Well, I told you yesterday, somebody, you know, got 100 Swiss francs from me, you know, for doing this. Not one, we didn't know about this number 191. We barely, you know, at that time, we could not even get the 58, right? We didn't sort of, we did singular, we were not so smart, we didn't have Bettini, you know. We couldn't go very far when I first started this. So when we first got the number 191 and we got it twice, I was surprised. I did not know at all why they should be the same. And then, you know, we kept going and we discovered the symmetry, okay? So, and I'll tell you more about it in a couple of minutes, okay? But we were surprised when we first saw that. Now, here's another thing. Um, in the meantime, there has been not just advances on the computational side, but also on the pure math side. Okay, so Junha got interested in algebraic statistics. Well, probably didn't hurt that his dad is a statistician in Seoul, but you know, I sort of kept talking him into it. Okay, so he got interested in, in some of these questions. 
And uh, he wrote two very nice papers, three actually, and uh, in particular he gave a topological interpretation. So, so even if you're not interested at all in statistics, or even if you're not interested at all in optimization, you, all you care about is pure math, maybe topology, there's still something in this for you, namely, June argues that this ML degree is a topological invariant of this open variety. So I take the determinantal variety and I remove all the you know, coordinate planes and I also remove the, the tables where the sum is zero. Right? So, so I'm removing M, N plus one hyperplane sections from the determinantal variety. So what I get is an open variety or a very affine variety, as the tropical people would say, or a pair. Right? So in Michigan, they call that a pair, right? a closed variety with a divisor at infinity. Okay? Now, if this variety were smooth, if this were a smooth open variety, if I did not have this singularity, then June argues this number is exactly the topological Euler characteristic. Now that's not surprising to Mehdi, right? Because Mehdi knows the situation when the variety is a linear space, right? And then it's exactly the topological Euler characteristic, very well known in the theory of hyperplane arrangements, but it's true also in the nonlinear case. Okay? Now in the presence of singularities, it's not the topological Euler characteristics, and we don't completely understand this yet. Um, but it's closely related to a certain characteristic class called the Chern, Chern, Schwartz, McPherson class. And again, it's an active area of research to really nail it exactly. So when I had this one joint paper with Chu and we had a conjecture that was recently disproved you know, by Nero Budur. So people are working on this. Okay? So, but it's some topological uh, invariant that generalizes the Euler characteristic. Not so surprising, right? If you study topology, you know to compute the Euler characteristic, you can use Morse theory. Right? And Morse theory is really optimization, counting critical points according to the indices. <laughs> Let's talk about symmetric matrices. So there's a parallel story for symmetric matrices. So if we have IID random variables, such as in problem six from last night, so now I have you know, several random variables. So I have an n by n matrix. I have uh, two random variables that are identically distributed. So then uh, I have a symmetric matrix and I have to put a 2 on the diagonal. So to make this correct, there has to be a 2 factor of 2 on the diagonal. And then the known values of, uh, for rank R symmetric matrices of the ML degree, here are the numbers. So again, you know, we have the, the rank 1. So this is actually, you know, here the entry, this is actually the, uh, uh, the, the, the situation um, that we talk to teach the freshman biologists, that's called the Hardy Weinberg equilibrium in genetics. Okay? Um, I'm going to talk about this number six in a moment. So, Cha Chang got a little bit into this, so we're going to discuss this number six. Oh no, you have a 12. No, you have the six. I think the six you're looking at. Yeah. Six, okay. And there are similar numbers, right? You see again, you know, there's a symmetry down the columns. This number, Jose, still owes me. Okay, just because you have a PhD doesn't mean you don't have to find that number. So we don't know that, we don't know that number yet. Okay, so, okay, so that's a theorem. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the number six. So let's do a particular example. Okay, so, okay, so let's look at three by three matrices and here are my data. So U11 is 10, U12 is 9, blah, 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 U33 is 7. Okay, that's my data set. Now I picked these data in a way that all six complex critical points are real and they're all positive. Okay? So just to make it a bit interesting. Okay? So here all six complex critical points are real and they have positive coordinates. Okay? And here are floating point approximations up to four digits for all of these numbers. Right? So this is the first critical point, so these are you know, positive real numbers and they're supposed to add up to one. So these are the six critical points. Here's the value of the log likelihood function, and they are negative. Okay? Um, this is the largest value. Okay? It's so early in the morning for some, right? If you had the logarithm of a number between 0 and 1, it's a negative number. 
and then to pick the largest among a bunch of negative numbers you pick the one with the smallest absolute value okay so clear so that's the the winner okay this is the MLE has the largest log likelihood value okay now in this example the first three points are local maxima in our five-dimensional simplex and the last three are local minima. So in this example, only in this example, there are no saddle points. There are three local maxima and there are three local minima. Okay, so, and then this first one is the global maximum and these other two are also uh, local maxima. Okay, now here's a question. Can, can we write these coordinates in radicals? It's an opinion. And maybe ask Kangjin. Do you think we could write this in radicals? These, these end numbers? Which number? These numbers. So this is a, this is a number. Oh, okay. Do you think I can express this number or that number in radicals over Q? Like the square root of something minus the fifth root, blah, blah, blah. So it's an opinion. Yes, do you think that can be done? Yes or no? Probably yes. <laughs> Probably yes. Abraham? Think yes. Yeah, I already lead the question. So, well, you were supposed to say no, right? Because this is an algebraic extension of degree 6. Right? So, so again, for the students, we take the critical equations, we go to the symbolic toolbox, we type them in, we eliminate all but one of the... So then we get one equation in one variable of degree 6 with rational coefficients. If you've taken an undergraduate class in algebra, you learned that typically, you know, you cannot write down the solution in radicals for an equation of degree 6. Most equations of degree 6, you can't do it. That's Galois theory. Okay? <coughs> yes? Can you do this trick for uh, higher degrees in, of the likelihood function in, in which... Which trick? Uh, you can choose zeta so that all your solutions are real. Can you? Uh, no. Oh, yes. Yes, we can Always? choose. We can choose some data such that all the solutions are real. Always. Always for all m, n, and r. Then you got a really good paper. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no. Then we're talking about a submissions to the Annals of Statistics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's an open problem. So if you can do that, if you can find a family, you know, I mean even, you know, if you can come up, even in these examples, if you can come up with an instance, you know, where all 2,341 <coughs> are real and positive and a significant number of local maxima, I'd like to know about it. That would be a very, very good result. Okay? So we're starting with small examples, but maybe we'll see patterns, you know, eventually some smart person, no names will be mentioned, will come along and figure this out. Okay? Um, yes. Is there any chance that because you're dealing with the symmetric matrix, you have an extension of degree six that's really just an extension of degree three? Uh, well, in this case, it's, so we'll get to that. It's an extension of degree four. So, so it turns out you can actually do it. So, yes, right? So I'm speaking about this at a symbolic computation meeting, so I have to do a symbolic computation. So for my data set, you know, this is the minimal polynomial of P33. So eliminate eight of the nine, you get this irreducible polynomial in P33, a tiny, tiny polynomial, and you solve it in radicals, right? So P33 is this number, where zeta is a primitive third root of unity, W1 is the square root of this thing, and then W2 is the cube root of that thing, and W3 is the square root of that thing. Okay? That's it. That's the solution in radical. So most analytically trained applied mathematicians wouldn't like this. They would prefer this way of writing the number. Right? But this is a much, much, much more complicated way of writing the number. You're not going to see the number ever, right? Because this has a floating point expansion. And you're going to die before you're done seeing the number. Not here. This is the number. This is a much simpler representation of the number than the floating point approximation. But that's a private opinion which you're most welcome not to share. Now more importantly, it's not so important of course to write this in radical. What this means 
is that there's inherent structure. In fact, the Galois group here is S4. So S4 embeds into S6 by permuting two guys out of four going to a party, right? And so there's some hidden special structure. So whenever the Galois group is smaller than expected, that means there's special structure, okay? Let's do an example. So last night at the burger place, I learned from Luke's wife, Noemi, that on the cubic surface, there are 27 lines, right? <coughs> Well, suppose you want to write down those 27 <laughs> lines and, you know, you haven't studied this as much as Noemi did, then naively you might think that the Galois group will be S27, that we have full symmetry on the 27 lines, okay? But that's very, very false. The Galois group is tiny, right? It's a tiny, tiny subgroup of S7. It's the vial group of type E6. Very small group. Remember E6 from the other day? Okay. Tiny, tiny group, okay? So the reason is that the 27 lines are a beautiful configuration. and There's inherent symmetry in the problem that drives the size of the Galois group and that leads you to give leads, in fact, Felix Klein, have I mentioned him before, to find a very nice, you know, analytic solution. I meant algebraic solution. Anyway, so there's hidden structure and uh, that brings us to the first theorem. So this is the solution of Dreisma and Jose to why the columns were observed to be symmetric. Suppose either in the general matrix case or in the symmetric matrix case, the first version of the theorem says that the rank R ML degree coincides with the rank M minus R plus 1 degree. Okay? The second theorem is a precise version of this statement. Here's what you do. Suppose you have a data matrix U. Let's say it's positive entries, for example. Then we form the so-called dualizing matrix omega U, whose entry in row I in column J is UIJ times the row sum value times the column sum value divided by the cube of the sample size. Okay. Then the following theorem holds. Let's say M is less than N. There's a bijection between the complex critical points, I'm going to call them P1, P2 up to PS, of the likelihood function on the rank R variety, and the complex critical points, I'm going to call them Q1 up to QS, on the other variety of rank M minus R plus 1. Okay, so I can sort them, I'm going to label them, I'm going to pick a permutation and I put them in bijection such that the following remarkable thing holds. If I take the Hadama product, the entry-wise product of P1 and Q1. So Hadama product means multiply the left-hand entry with the left-hand entry. The next entry, so entry by entry, I'm going to multiply them. That's a matrix. That these are all equal. Each of these Hadama products are all equal. And they're all equal to the dualizing matrix omega U. Okay. Now why does this make sense? To see that that makes sense, let's think about R equals 1. Right? Well, if R equals 1, then S is 1. That's sort of silly, right? But this is exactly the Hadama product of the rank 1 solution and the full rank solution. Right? The, the rank 1 solution was this times this divided by this squared. And the full rank, the parrot solution, was just this divided by the sample size. Right? So for r equals 1, that's the right thing to do. And the theorem says this works for other values of r. Now notice, this bijection preserves all the structure. So it preserves reality, positivity, and rationality. So you can, if you know pi, you can calculate qi. Right? If you know p1, you can recover q1 by Hadama division. Let's say all numbers are non-zero, right? So, well, this is a, a matrix with positive entries, re I mean, integer entries, or rational entries. You just divide entry by entry, right? So if pi is, has only real entries, then qi has only real entries. If pi has only positive entries, you know, uh, rational entries, so all the structure is preserved, okay? And, uh, well, that's exactly what we saw here, right? So these are dual in this sense. So. This solution is dual to that solution, this is dual to that, this is dual to that. And you can see that additively. So on the additive scale, this number plus this number is equal to this plus this 
and this plus this, and that explains why the Galois group is S4 rather than S6. Okay. If, for example, you choose the data is arbitrary, that's the negative. The what? The, so the data, um, uh, yes, let, let's say I use them generic. So in the sense of algebraic geometry. So really I have a, a correspondence, I have a base, which is the U space, and the generic fiber has length equal to the ML degree, and then, you know, these fibers are bi bijection, but then special fibers you have to make a scheme theoretic statement. Okay, so let's say the U is sort of random. Okay. Now here's another thing that's kind of interesting maybe for statisticians. So, I mean, you have a bijection, right? So you can take advantage of this computationally. So suppose I want to find the best solution here, right? But it's harder to compute for rank 4 than for rank 2. Well, I might as well find all the critical points here and then read off the best one there. In fact, the value of the likelihood function is reserved. Right? If I want to solve the maximum likelihood problem here, it's equivalent to solve the minimum likelihood problem there. If I want to solve the maximum likelihood problem here, I can solve the minimum likelihood problem there. Okay? So I can take advantage of the duality. So it's the order preserving. Right, so the, it's an order preserving bijection, just like in the example. And I think your project right now is to take all these U's and make a complete real root classification. Okay, uh, here are some references. So as I said, you know, Jose is a really cool guy and he has a general theory now that explains this in very general context. Background on algebraic uh, statistics, a paper with June that just appeared. And the remaining time, I'd like to tell you about another paper um, together with Kaya Kubias and Elena Robeva, who now sits on a plane, or almost does. Okay. Are there any questions about what I said so far and about these theorems? Because I'm going to shift gears now. Okay. Now that's all a nice story. And that's a cool theorem, but unfortunately that's the wrong object for a statistician. So we, we actually unfortunately didn't study quite the right thing. So the object that statisticians are interested in is not MR, but it's the so-called mixture model. So let me define that. The mixture model can be described in several ways. So a quick way, if you know graphical models, is this graphical model, where white means that's a hidden random variable, and, and dark means an observed random variable. Okay. So that's the graphical representation of the mixture model. If this is observed, this is observed, that's you know, hidden. That's a, if you make this the root, that's a phylogenetic model. Okay. So in, in linear algebra language, the mixture model is the set of all matrices P that have a factorization, a non-negative factorization, A times lambda times B, where A is a non-negative M by R matrix whose rows sum to 1. So those are the parameters coming from this edge. And then B is a non-negative R by N matrix whose columns sum to 1. Those are the model parameters coming from that edge. And lambda is a non-negative diagonal matrix size R whose entries sum to 1. Those are the mixture probabilities. Okay? So the set of these matrices are exactly, that's a little lemma, easy lemma, these are exactly the matrices in the simplex of non-negative rank at most R. Those are the ones that we're interested in in the application. That's the model. So, so the real goal is not to maximize the likelihood function over VR or MR. The real goal is to maximize the likelihood function over the semi-algebraic set, which is this mixture model. Now I should maybe say, somebody asked the other day, so, so these things are always semi-algebraic sets by Tarski's theorem of quantify elimination. If you have a, a map from some parameter polytope given by polynomials, the image will be automatically semi-algebraic. But that's a theorem. Okay. okay, so we have this mixture model. So this mixture model sits inside MR, right? So every matrix like this is a non-negative matrix of rank at most R. But maybe not all matrices you know, admit this factorization. So it's rank versus non-negative rank. 
So here's a proposition that tells us when they are the same and when they are different. So the low rank model MR that I described is the always is the risk closure of the mixture model. Okay. So if you're only interested in equations that hold, there's no difference. Can, you cannot distinguish them by equations. You can only distinguish them by inequalities. Okay? Now if the rank is really small, if the rank is 2, then they are the same. So if you have a matrix of classical rank 1 or 2, then rank and non-negative rank is the same, so the model, the low rank model, is the same as the mixture model. But as soon as the rank is 3 or more, the mixture model is properly contained in the low rank model. Okay, so let me say again, so, so this is the thing we talked about for about 40 minutes, we have duality theory and so on, and this is the subset we really want to optimize over. Okay. I don't know how much smaller it is. I'll get to that. Well, I know, in, in general, much smaller. So like always with Murphy's Law, right? In, in the limit, most guys are bad, right? Like, same with non-realizable matroids and non-polytopal spheres. And once you have one bad guy, you see bad guys everywhere. Okay, so here's the smallest example. So if M and N are four and the rank is three, okay? So if you have four by four matrices of rank three, non-negative, they might have non-negative rank four. And we've seen uh, an example like this in the homework, here in the exercises, and here's a slight generalization. So I take this matrix, I fill it with integers A and B, and I pretend this is my data set. Right? Suppose I have a data set that looks like this, where A and B are positive integers, A bigger than B. Okay? Now this matrix always has rank 3, right? so the first and the last row sum to the same thing as the middle two rows. It's a rank 3 matrix. But it has a non-negative rank 4 if A is much bigger than B. Okay? And this is exactly the boundary. Right? So as soon as B is less than the square root of 2 minus 1 times A, right? that's exactly the boundary, then the non-negative rank goes up. Right? So there's on, on the AB line, right? so on the AB segment, there's a border. Right? The border is square root of 2 minus 1. You know. I'm transitioning from non-negative rank 3 to non-negative rank 4. Okay? And if we are beyond that border, right, then, well, then this distribution you divide by the sample size is a distribution that would lie in the low rank model but not in the mixture model. Okay? That's clear? Statement clear? Okay. So what do we do? Well, this is sort of to answer Professor Holmson's question. So how typical are these things? So we investigated this from a more st sort of statistical point of view. So let me define uh, some objects. I'm going to write delta mix for the topological boundary of the mixture model. Okay? So I have the mixture model. It sits inside the low rank model. So here's the, the low rank model, you know, and then I have some subset of the same dimension. You know, that's the mixture model and that has a boundary. Okay, so it's a, a boundary inside, it's the relative boundary, is that clear? So it's the set of all points in the mixture model such that every epsilon neighborhood have, has a guy that's inside, another guy that's outside, mm -hmm. the usual topological. Okay, now... Close it's closed. It's closed. It's the close. It's, a, it's the image of a polytope, a compact polytope under a polynomial map. Right, so. so these these all are in a polytope. Right? So it's all, you know, this is a compact set of parameters. A, gamma, B, you know, some non-negative, summing to one, right? They lie in a polytope. Then I have a, a polynomial map, a continuous map called multiplication. And then the image is a closed compact set. Right? So I have a compact set, I apply a continuous map, I get a compact set. Okay. Now therefore, what will typically happen is the MLE will lie in the boundary. Okay? So to make this clear, right? So here is my, you know, my boundary, okay? Now I have some data that's over here, right? So now the true optimum over this model will usually lie in the boundary. It will rarely lie in the interior. And this is what this table says. So we did an experiment 
What's the percentage of times when the MLE lies on the boundary of the mixture mode? Okay, so we, we did something very simple. We just took matrices, square matrices of various sizes, and we look, fix the non-negative rank to be 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay? Then we picked a random data set. Uh, now we did first something that the statisticians didn't like. We just picked a random data set in the simplex. We just picked a random non-negative table with respect to uniform distribution and we did the ex experiment. Okay? And that's the table. The referee didn't like that. They say, well, in statistics, you don't do that. You, what you do instead, you pick a true distribution in the model, you know, at random, and then you take samples from that true distribution, and then you see what you get. Okay? And surprisingly, happily, we got more or less the same for re reasonable sample size. So that's, you know, there's a revision, and you know, all the paper, and so on. But this was the first experiment. You pick a random data table. So for 4x4, four four, this happens rarely. Only 4.4% land on the boundary. But as soon as the size is a little bigger, like for 8x8 eight eight matrices, with overwhelming probability, you will lie on the boundary. So here, you know, 8x8 eight eight of rank 4, we calculate the true optimum over this compact set. By some method, we find the actual maximum over this, and, and we check, is it in the boundary or is it in the interior, by some method. And then 95% of the time it's on the boundary, and 5% it's in the interior. Now, what that means for the theory with Jose and John, that only 5% of the cases we would have found using these critical equations, right? Because the Jose equation, that earlier approach, we're finding critical points on the determinantal variety. Now, if the, if the optimum is in the interior, it will be critical relative to the whole determinantal variety, it will be found. So that method, the earlier method, the one you go into MATLAB and you do the symbolic toolbox and all that, that earlier method will succeed 5% of the time and will fail 95% of the time on, on that instance. Okay? Now, whenever you have a topological boundary in this class, you also define the algebraic boundary, right? Because whenever you have a complicated semi-algebraic set, such as the boundary of this toilet paper, you make the problem easier by passing to the Zariski closure. So I'm going to define the algebraic boundary of the mixture model to be the Zariski closure of the topological boundary. So this is the set of all points at which all polynomials vanish that also vanish on the boundary. And again, that's a projective variety inside of co-dimension one inside the determinantal variety. So my sheet of paper is the determinantal variety. My toilet paper is the mixture model. The boundary here is some curve. It has the risky closure. That's some curve on the determinantal variety. Okay. So how do you generate a random set of data for a given uh, non-negative way? Um, so here is what we did. So, so the, in the second scheme, yeah. So if you pick a lambda and b at random, according to your prior belief, right? That picks a point in the model. Okay. And once you then you fix that distribution, and then you sample from the state space of size m n according to this distribution. You just pick a point using this distribution. Pick, 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 pick. That. You make so there are several stages. Then that gives you the U, and then that U, you try to recover the parameters by maximum likelihood estimation. It's all it's explained in the paper. That's all you know. Short version is in the first iteration we did the thing that was obvious to me but incorrect statistically, and then the second version we did a little bit better. Okay, okay. Uh, here's a theorem about the algebraic boundary. And we have a theorem in the rank 3 case at the moment, and the higher rank case, open problem. Okay. So the algebraic boundary <coughs> is a reducible variety of pure co-dimension 1 inside the determinantal variety. So the determinantal variety of rank 3 matrices has dimension mn plus, uh, sorry, 3m plus 3n minus 10. And we have one less. Let's make sure everybody understands this number, right? So I have a, an m by n matrix. 
and I want to calculate the degrees of freedom in picking a, ra a rank 3 matrix. So how many entries can you pick to make a rank 3 matrix? Well, you can pick the first three columns. You pick a bunch of numbers, any numbers you want. Right? So that's 3M numbers. You can also pick the first three rows any way you want, right? So you have 3M plus 3N, but then there's an overlap of 9. Right? So you can certainly pick this many numbers and fill it up to a rank 3 matrix, but that's it. As soon as you pick, you know, you have a constraint on every other number. That's the degrees of freedom, right? So that's the dimension of the determinantal variety, VR, as an affine variety. But of course, we do this projectively on the simplex, so it's dimension 3m plus 3n minus 10, and our boundary has co-dimension 1. It has, you know, this dimension, okay? The number of irreducible components, well, there's a trivial factor. This is just the boundary of the simplex, mn, and then this is the number, that's an integer. That's the number of irreducible components in the algebraic boundary of the mixture model. Okay, so what are these components? There's a description of these components. So, well, it turns out that this number is the sum of this thing and that thing, product of binomials. And they have a parametric representation as P times AB. Uh, a, B are matrices of size M, R, and R, N. And then there's a rule. You know, A has three zeros in distinct rows and columns, and B has four zeros in three rows and distinct columns. And then you work it out, and that's the number of possibilities you get. And then by symmetry, you get another one. Okay, so, so for example, in the 4x4 four four case, <coughs> here's the... Um, well, there are 16 trivial components, just if you run into the boundary of the simplex, and there are 144 non-trivial components that have this parametric representation. So I'm interested in matrices like this that admit this kind of factorization with the particular zero pattern. And Luke, this is not invariant under the group you like, unfortunately. Okay, so that's a variety in the space of matrices. And you type that into Maple or Macaulay or, you know, single or something, and you implicitize. And you find that this 13-dimensional variety, so inside the determinantal hypersurface, we have co-dimension 1, we have a 13-dimensional variety, and it's cut out by five equations. And after some back and forth and some help from Aldo Conca, we were able to write it like this. So. This is the 4x4 four four minors of a 4x5 matrix. It's co-dimension 2, Hilbert Birch. So you write down, you take your given 4x4 four four matrix, you add this column, and then you take the maximal minors, and then you see, right, there are, there's the original determinant, and then there are four sextics. There are four equations of degree 6. Okay. So that's all variety. Um, so that's the boundary. So there are many, many boundary components, but now we've gained, we're beginning to gain an understanding, and it's on those boundaries that with overwhelming probability the true estimates, the true optima lie. Now, we were able to solve, answer a question that was asked in the paper with Jose and Hauenstein. So this, each of these components has ML degree 633, okay? So if you find the optimal solution by some other method, for example, the EM algorithm. If you find the optimal solution by some other method, then each coordinate of your optimal solution will be an algebraic number expected to have degree 633 over the rations. So since you said it's not symmetric under the group I like, <laughs> have any symmetry left over? Is there a subgroup of the group? Yeah, that's a good question. We haven't looked at this carefully yet. So there's, I mean, certainly there's a torus action. Um, Certainly, you know, you have sort of a, a torus action. I don't think you have anything else other than the obvious torus. I don't think you have a, a sort of a non-abelian group. Yeah. I mean, of course, it, I mean, of course the, 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 it moves the components around. So the, the components are symmetric. So that, that's an important symmetry. But each individual component I don't think has any other symmetry other than a sort of a trivial torus action. 
Okay, so let me wrap it up. So in this paper with Alina and Kaya, we have a quantifier-free semi-algebraic formula for mix three. So we have a description of this mixture model as a semi-algebraic set, not just the algebraic boundary, but also the topological boundary. We have a very, very careful study of the so-called EM algorithm, expectation maximization algorithm. That's a dynamical system. That's a dynamical system that operates on the parameter polytope. So you start somewhere in the parameter polytope, you run a step, you run a step, you run a step, and uh, hope for the best. And then that's what most people use. Uh, this is all based on the geometry of nested polygons. I don't have the time to explain that in this context. So EM is the method that uh, most practitioners will use. And it's interesting, it's actually equivalent to the algorithm of Lee Sung, Lee and Sung for non-negative matrix factorization. So, so most practitioners, so I mentioned there's the colleague at NIMS who does this without statistics. So he uses the Lee Sung method and that's the EM algorithm. Okay, time is up. So conclusion is, in my opinion, some of these approaches can be useful uh, for statistics. Um, there are many, many questions how to generalize this to larger ranks, to generalize this to tensors, other classes of models that are relevant in, in computational biology. And then never, ever, ever forget in the next 12 months that we'll all meet again in Dijon in August 2015 and you will become a SIAM and special interest group member until then. Let's take a five minute break.